I'm going to try to talk less and take questions. I'll just give a, a couple of five, seven slides and then uh, I'll take questions because I, I know that uh, bladder is always uh, an interesting subject. De definitely I'm not talking about all things urologicals, but I'm going to uh, go through a couple of principles. So the bladder, bladder has uh, two principles. One is storage, the other one is elimination. Um, they require different activity of the nervous system. Um, you have uh, the average bladder vol volume is 350 to 500 uh, uh, milliliters. Elimination requires both voluntary and uh, uh, reflexogenic contractions. Average 24-hour uh, urine is 1,600 milliliters, but that's actually the minimum because you should drink more like 2,000 liter. Whatever goes in goes out. Um, in your 20s, 20% 20 of the urine is made at nighttime, but as we grow a little bit more mature, uh, the amount that we make at nighttime increases. Uh, in individuals with paralysis, actually, there is a reversal of the hormone that uh, helps with the regulating the amount that is made at nighttime. So it is possible that half of the urine is, is being produced at nighttime, thus it needs to be ev evacuated at that time. So there are ways to, uh, to deal with that. In individuals with transverse myelitis or spinal cord disease related uh, um, Blood, neurogenic bladder, the, the problems that are mostly that you would come to a doctor to, to complain of are urgency, increased urinary frequency, incontinence, or in the inability to void on your own. And then the always recurring urinary tract infections. That's the bladder. It's a big, big muscle that uh, has two tubes that bring the urine from the kidneys, stored in the bladder. The bladder expands, expands, expands. At some point, it can't expand anymore. While the bladder is expanding, is relaxing, that big muscle is relaxing, the sphincter stays contracted. So you get a balloon. At some point, that stretch is enough to trigger a reflexogenic void, meaning a contraction of the muscle, then normally the, blood, the sphincter needs to open. There are two sphincters. One is the internal, one is the external sphincter. The internal sphincter is not under your voluntary control. The external sphincter is under your voluntary control. That's the one that <coughs> we do this when we need to go to the bathroom. So we can control one normally if you have a spinal cord disease that affects uh, um, the bladder uh, control, you will not be able to control that one. So you'll be dependent on this muscle, the big muscle and the involuntary sphincter activity. They usually have to work antagonistically. When one contracts, the other one relaxes and vice versa. With individuals who that have injury to their spinal cord, there is no, no, there is that inability to coordinate the, the contractions. So you have co-contraction of the bladder and the sphincter. So there are numerous dysfunctions that are neurologic based when you have that incontinence. When you, when there is inability to hold the unit, it's not just one case, one mechanism. There are numerous mechanisms and because of that it is important to figure out what exactly is wrong. How do we do that? You talk to a neurourologist or a spinal cord injury medicine specialist that is uh, uh, knowledgeable in, in, in bladder management. There are some receptors there. Why am I putting this here? Not for you to remember. Just to tell you that there are multiple receptors that respond to those chemicals that I was alluding to in that my first talk. I said that we work on drugs, on chemicals. There are about nine classes of chemicals that make us do everything. Make us talk, make us talk with the Romanian accent, make us be funny or not, make us, make us think, make us be depressed or happy, make us pee, make us poo, 
make us do everything. We are basically uh, creatures of uh, run by electricity and chemicals. So two of them, the muscarinic, so th there's this big class of medication that is used to control the bladder incontinence. Bladder incontinence is definitely not only related to spinal cord disease or strokes or so forth. As we get to be more mature, uh, there is um, uh, an abnormality of the nervous system. Maybe we call it aging or something like that. Um, that actually leads to incontinence. That's why we have a $3 billion industry when it comes to adult diapers. And here it is, Lisa Arena. Um, <laughs> those medications affect different receptors. The M3 is the one that mediates the bladder contraction. They're M1 to M5, the anticholinergics are M1 to M5. M1 makes you a little crazy because it is a lot into the, into the brain. And two and M3s are in the bladder. Fours and fives, I don't know about it. It's not in my, uh, uh, in my field of, of work. The M2s and M3s are the one that we modulate when it comes to anticholinergics. And why am I talking about them? Because they have different side effects. And ev everybody uh, will complain about um, feeling fatigued or having constipation or having dry mouth or inability to sweat after taking some of the anticholinergics. Well, you can modulate, you can ask for a different one because they have different side effects, because they affect the M2s and M3s differently. Okay, we have medication that decrease the bladder spasms, medication that increase the bladder compliance, the ability to stretch, and then there is a category that helps open the sphincter, the internal sphincter, the one that is not under your voluntary control. They're differently, in eff they're different in effectiveness. Some of them are more effective than others. Some of them start acting earlier than the others. If the drugs taken once a day or twice or three times a day are not your cup of tea, and if you, all you have is a spastic bladder, you can pay money to have Botox into the bladder instead of onto your forehead. <laughs> this one is covered by insurance. And what does this do? It does not help you eliminate, but it helps you store. So if the problem is incontinence because of decreased compliance, decreased stretching ability, or because you have increased bladder com uh, muscle contraction, this is a good, a good treatment if how you eliminate the, bla the bladder is by intermittent catheterization. Otherwise, I would not recommend it because it takes, it, it can paralyze your bladder, not, con not completely and not forever, but it can put you from a person that voids on its own to a person that needs to use a catheter. And I don't think that that's a shock that you want to add to uh, the paralysis and spasticity in neurogenic and the neuropathic pain. Um, let's see. Oh, yes. Yeah. So then, if you're in a situation in which you need to empty your bladder, you have a bunch of options. One is voluntary. Yes, I'll take that one. If that doesn't work, there is a method of bladder retraining. If you have an incomplete injury, it's kind of like training your, uh, your toddler to go to the, to the bathroom and be continent. Because an, an injury to the nervous system is basically returning your neurologic um, status to earlier in, in the development. You have to learn to do everything again, to go to the bathroom, to walk, to thread a needle. Uh, um, everything has to be relearned. So is there a, a, a 
place for scheduled time vo voiding for bladder retraining, sure. If you can void enough to empty the bladder so it doesn't, so it empties is well enough so you don't have recurrent urinary tract infection and you can use some medication to help with that. I'll mention it at the end, but that needs to be done under very careful uh, urologic or bladder management control because it, it takes a lot of, of uh, uh, a lot of fine tuning. But scheduled and time voiding is part of, of the bladder emptying method. Reflex void, Reflex void is basically taking advantage of what uh, Dr. Kabahu was mentioning when you hit something, something else moves. Well, you can empty the bladder by not necessarily, I don't know if I want to open this, it's, it's a little bit more intimate, <laughs> but there, is, there are ways of triggering the, uh, the bladder spasm to empty the bladder. Come ask me. Um, Credem Valsalva maneuvers are uh, basically pushing onto the bladder. Uh, that again needs to be done under, once we know what's going on with the pressures inside because you don't want to push on the bladder and then have all the uh, urine go back as in, in the form of vesicoureteral reflux and, and, and uh, back up into your kidneys and give you what it's called hydronephrosis, which means a swollen kidney, which actually damages your kidney. So that can't be done on its own. Catheterization. Condom, if you're a guy and you have safe bladder pressures, you can use it. You can use it in combination with that reflex void. Um, indwelling, I hate, but sometimes is the only way uh, especially for women with poor trunk control or no hand function. Um, the, the principles are whenever you leave uh, um, a catheter inside, it's, it's a ladder for bugs to come from the outside in. So not a good thing, but sometimes you have to do it. If I have to pick in between a Foley and a uh, suprapubic catheter, I'll take the suprapubic only because the Foley does a lot of damage. It can get pulled and the perineal area is a lot uh, less strong than the abdominal area. And then it also, if you are still sexually active, having a suprapubic, it still allows you to do that while having a Foley it doesn't. Anyway, I don't like those. Um, intermittent catheterization is if you have to use a catheter, that's the best technique. If you can do it on your own, is, is the best because it, it has, literature shows that is the least amount of recurrent UTIs occur when you do your own catheterization. So if you are looking at catheter, catheterizations, so intermittent, self-intermittent catheterization is the least likely to give you recurrent UTIs. The next one is uh, person, caregiver, care partner um, catheterization, intermittent catheterization, then is the indwelling, which can be a suprapubic or the uh, folding. And then, I'm just mentioning that those pharmacologic agents over there, the alpha blocking agents and the cholinergic agents, because I told you that I'm going to tell about you, about you about them. So alpha blocking agents are the ones that are helping relax the sphincter. If you can void but not empty the bladder completely, you can use an alpha blocking agent to help the muscle in the sphincter relax and completely empty the bladder. Not, again, this is dependent on the neurologic status of the, of the um, bladder, but it can be detected, it can be very well um, assessed by undergoing urodynamic studies. If you are going to have urodynamic studies, please do it with a neurourologist or somebody that does spinal cord injury medicine because a regular urologist does not know neurourology. 
A regular urologist only knows that the bladder needs to empty, doesn't know the cabling involved. Neurourologist will. So either them or a spinal cord injury medicine specialist with a uh, uh, specific uh, specialty in this. Cholinergic agents, that is this beta necol, one drug that if your bladder muscle is weak, has some activity, but it's weak, and you can empty the sphincter, you can get this one drug that can increase the strength. Probably I use it in less than 1% of my patients because it is a dangerous drug if you don't know what the pressures are, because if you squeeze and it doesn't go down, and it goes up. And going up means pyelonephritis, again, the damage to the kidney. Then there are some surgical procedures over there. One is metrophenov, um, which you put the conduit into the bladder and bring it out to the skin so you can do the catheterization, especially for women higher up, uh, instead of trying to get into the per perineal area. And then bladder augmentation in which if uh, you've gone long enough with the neurogenic bladder in which that big muscle in the bladder contracts, when it contracts, it gets thicker. That means it's less stretchy and it decreases the amount of urine that you can store. And people will tell you, oh, you have the bladder of a, like a chestnut or like a um, um, what, small pea or <laughs> oh, a bladder there, like a small pea. Um, so when, whenever you hear all those uh, uh, vegetarian uh, c comparison, it, it might be time to do a bladder augmentation in which we take either large bowel, small bowel, kind of patch it up, increase the, um, the ability of the bladder to store so you can um, do intermittent catheterization. I hope that in this day and age, nobody gets to need that because we have enough knowledge to prevent that from happening. Okay, symptomatic UTIs. Um, so if you have an indwelling, I'm not talking about the, the, the bladders that evacuate normally or without an intermittent, without a catheter. If you void on your own, just by being a female or having sex, you increase the risk of UTI. So please deal with those. I don't know if sex changes the, how, how you deal with it, but um, yeah. So being a woman, you have a shorter, a shorter uh, uh, urethra. So that means uh, there is more likelihood of the perennial uh, uh, bacterial uh, colony to, to load to, to go back into the, the bladder. That does you have increased risk of symptomatic UTIs. Um, but if you have an, uh, a catheter, if you use a catheter to uh, uh, void, um, you're going to uh, have recurrent urinary tract infections. In my practice, I'm trying to keep them under four per year. Um, insurance companies usually pay for uh, sterile catheters if you document two or, two or more UTIs per year. So those are numbers to keep in mind. Um, symptoms, as Dr. Kabahu said, uh, increased spasticity, but also uh, on onset of urinary incontinence, discomfort, pain, onset of autonomic dysreflexia or this abnormal blood pressure, too high, too low, too high, too low, uh, with uh, goosebumps and facial flushing and sweating above the level of the injury, cloudy urine with increased odor, uh, just not feeling well. The diagnosis and treatment is by using laboratory, urine analysis and culture and sensitivity, always. You can do empiric antibiotic treatment, you can take, a, oh, I know that my, uh, my uh, UTIs always respond to, to Bactrim. You can do that, but still get a, a urine sample before Take it out, send it to you, to you to the lab, to your doctor, and in, usually in three days you get the result of, yeah, Bactrim still works or no, nah, hey, you took enough Bactrim, by now the bug is resistant. That's why I say tailor the antibiotics specifically and narrowly to the bug because having too many, 
to, treating the urinary tract infection with a big gun like your Cipro, um, uh, it's going to create very resistant bugs and then you're going to be um, transitioning to uh, IV or intramuscular injections. Because it is a neurogenic bladder, the treatment is not uh, three days or seven days, it is 10 days. Lots of people forget about that. It is a complicating urinary tract infection because of the neurologic injury. Recurrent UTIs, as I said, female sexual activity, pre-existing condition, uh, kidney or bladder stones, the swollen kidney, changes, anatomical changes in the, uh, in the bladder because of the neurogenic bladder. These are all causes for recurrent UTI. So in my practice, if, you, if somebody has four or more UTIs per year, I look for a reason. Why is this happening? Uh, and usually I do urodynamics whenever the, uh, the uh, bladder pattern changes. I check ultrasounds of the kidneys. I check CT scan of the abdomen. Uh, I do cystoscopy. I ask, well, I don't do cystoscopy on my own. I ask uh, my, neuro, my friendly neurourologist to do cystoscopy and culture that biofilm that's on the inside uh, so I can specifically address, treat whatever is the reason for recurrent UTIs. Testing, I kind of mentioned. Eurodynamic testing, good thing to have to establish baseline and every time your bladder pattern changes. The treatment of recurrent UTIs, um, you treat either, the, so there are conditions, you have colonization in which the bugs are there, but they're not really invading the tissue. That means that they're not inducing uh, inflammatory changes in, into the bladder, and uh, you not, don't necessarily have to treat that. Symptomatic UTIs, we talked about them. And then there is this condition called sterile pyuria in which you have white cells, but you don't have bugs. If that is the case, and it is not a partially treated UTI, you definitely need to see an infectious disease specialist because it could be one of the bugs like mycobacteria, like TB or uh, specific bugs that don't grow uh, on the typical media. Um, we talked about empiric versus directed antibiotic treatment. Directed is always the best. Prevention done with a bunch of things and I was just talking with my new friend uh, Robert, and he told me that he swears by Allura, and I know why, uh, because it does work. But cranberry, methanamine, D-mannose, Allura, acidifiers, probiotics. And this, I think you have this because I was a very good speaker, and I sent all my uh, slides before, so you should have it in your booklet. <laughs> All of those, so the level of evidence is there. When you see a yes, that means that there is control, there are controlled studies that show that that works for UTI prevention. Uh, what am I going to talk about intermittent catheterization? Just that there are different methods. There is the clean versus the sterile. Then there is the clean with sterile catheter and there is the sterile with sterile technique. Uh, I ask some of my patients and some of my nurses about uh, uh, their preferred catheters and they all like hydrophilic and, uh, 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 cat catheters. The names are there, Hollister and Low Frick. Um, they also like the Speedy Cath and Flex Coudé. Lubricant, nobody cares what kind of lubricant they use. I did mention two documented UTIs without sending that culture, that urinalysis and culture to, your, to the lab. You will not have two documented UTIs. That means that your insurance company will not cover for those $1,200 worth of catheters. Um, okay, let's see others. Somebody asked me if, I can, if we can do muscle strengthening to improve bladder emptying. Yes. Typically you can if it is an incomplete injury. So if you have enough, you should use biofeedback. I'm not very good at that. I do believe that activity 
helps bowel and bladder. So, um, but if you just want to do specific muscle strengthening to improve bladder emptying, probably there are numerous centers that do biofeedback pelvic uh, um, guided strengthening. Uh, as a physician that treats this day in and day out, I think that voiding diaries are very helpful. When you come to me and say, hey, this is what's happening to my bladder, it helps me tell you, okay, these are the options. I did mention that there is a medication that can help us be younger. No, that's not true. Uh, actually, there are metformin and HGH, but that's a different talk. Um, so the, if you have excessive, excessive urine production at nighttime, there is this one medication that's more present or the DVAVP that can be taken in, in the evening to help regulate the amount of that hormone at night so you s don't produce two liters. Uh, doesn't work in everybody, but it's, it's, it's an option. And then again, I seem to be getting back to the role of aging. We all have changes as we age. So because you have a TM or NMO that doesn't stop the ticking of the clock. Thank you, questions? Actually, if we can hold questions for a little bit later, we